I just want to take a minute to let you know, if you like This Is Monsters, you might like my other show, Somewhere Sinister. Each season, we go to a different place and tell sinister stories from that area. You can check it out by going to this link here. Thanks so much, and on to the story. One dead wife could be an accident, but two dead wives is a pattern. When Harold Henthorne's second wife plunged off a cliff to her death, investigators not only questioned that supposed accident, but they began to examine the mysterious death of his previous wife more closely. This is Monsters. It was September 19, 2012, and Tony Henthorn was hiking through Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park. As she was making her way along the top of a sheer cliff, something went wrong. She might have misjudged a step. She might have tripped, stumbled, or lost her balance. Whatever happened in those few seconds on top of that cliff ended Tony's life, causing her to fall almost 150 feet down the cliff and onto the rocky ground below. The force of the impact caused a massive blunt force trauma, and at 50 years old, Tony Henthorne died of blood loss in the wilderness. On the weekend of her death, Tony Henthorne was celebrating 12 years of marriage to her husband, Harold Henthorne. Tony and Harold had met later in life, and both of them were desperate to have children. On paper, they seemed like a great match. Two career-driven, family-oriented people looking to settle down. Harold had been widowed after his previous wife had died in an accident, and Tony had been married once, but it hadn't worked out. After less than a year of dating, Harold proposed. Tony said yes, and the pair were married nine months into their relationship. Tony's job as an ophthalmologist and Harold's successful career in fundraising left them in a great position to start a family as soon as possible. Tony's parents, Yvonne and Bob Bertolet, had raised a daughter who was independent and always knew her own worth. Since high school, Tony had chased success, putting in the hard work to get what she wanted. As a teenager, she'd been a successful athlete, and she decided to pursue a career in medicine because she believed that God's plan for her was helping other people. That faith in God had always been Tony's guiding light. It didn't matter so much to her that she went through her 20s and early 30s without finding the love of her life. Even when her first marriage fell apart, she was confident that she was on the path that was right for her. Even during the early stages of Tony's marriage, one dawning realization became clear to her family. Her parents, along with her brother Barry, didn't like her husband at all. At first, they'd been pleased that their daughter had finally found someone that she wanted to settle down with. Harold had quickly become a fixture in Tony's life, making it clear that he planned to be around for the long haul. He showered Tony and her parents with lavish promises telling them that because of his huge income, Tony, who was happy with her job as an eye surgeon after going through years of medical school, would never have to worry about working again. The relationship was picture-perfect on the surface. Tony and Harold tried to conceive for years, and finally Tony became pregnant, giving birth to a little girl. It was everything she'd ever wanted, but for Tony's friends and family, the story didn't seem to be a happy one at all. Tony's loved ones received a new Christmas card every year, updating them on the life of Tony's new happy family. Tony and Harold had a beautiful home together, and they were raising a beautiful little girl that Tony had always dreamed of. But despite the images of a happy family that Harold and Tony projected out to the world, the changes to Tony were obvious to anyone who knew her, especially her parents. And they weren't changes that anyone had expected. It began when Harold asked Tony to relocate to Colorado with them. Harold's job meant that he could continue his career from anywhere, but he didn't seem to have any specific reason to move to Colorado, away from Tony's entire support system. Almost all of Tony's friends and family lived in Mississippi, and after Harold married Tony, her family should have become his family, but he didn't have any interest in that. What Tony didn't know was that Harold did have a reason for convincing her to move out of state. He wanted to slowly cut her off from the people she loved so that he could have her all to himself. Tony agreed to move to Colorado with the expectation that she would be able to regularly fly home to visit her loved ones. 
As soon as the couple had relocated, though, Harold told Tony that he didn't want to return to Mississippi. He could afford it, he just didn't want to, and no amount of pleading would convince him otherwise. If Tony wanted to see her elderly parents, Yvonne and Bob had to book plane tickets and fly to Colorado. For her entire life, Tony had been incredibly close with her mother. She'd grown up hearing about Yvonne's job as a nurse, and it was part of the reason that she decided to pursue a career as a doctor. After Tony moved away, she tried to maintain this closeness with her mother, replacing daily visits with long phone calls. But when Yvonne called Tony, she noticed something strange. She was never able to have a phone call with just her daughter. No matter when she called, Harold was always there as well. In fact, he was always the one to pick up the phone in the first place. He'd greet Yvonne in a cheery, upbeat voice, and then put the phone on speaker instead of handing it to his wife. When Yvonne and Bob asked Tony questions, Harold was usually the one to answer. His voice was loud and clear, while Tony's answers were soft as if she was standing further away from the phone. Harold had never said outright that he forbade Tony from having phone conversations without him, but his actions quickly made it clear to both Tony and her parents that this was the case. In those phone conversations, Harold seemed to be in a perpetually good mood, as if there was nothing he would rather do than talk to his in-laws. Tony was quiet and subdued, whereas Harold filled the gaps in conversations with endless bragging. Since Harold and Tony first started dating, Yvonne and Bob had noticed that Harold constantly made himself the center of attention. They tried hard to accept him for who he was, believing that because Tony loved him, there must be a kind, lovable man under the obnoxious exterior. Now, on the other end of a phone and desperately wanting to talk to their daughter, Yvonne and Bob's patience with Harold began to run out. It was 2005 when Tony gave birth to her much-awaited first child, a daughter named Haley. Privately, Yvonne and Bob had hoped that having a child might make Harold's control of Tony relax a little. After Haley was born, though, it quickly became clear that the opposite was true. Harold's behavior got worse and worse. With Haley and their family, Harold now had a second person that he wanted to control at all times. Everything that Haley ate and drank was determined by Harold. He controlled her mealtimes, her hobbies, and when she went to sleep and woke up. Tony was forbidden from reading Haley a bedtime story or tucking her into bed at night. That was Harold's daddy-daughter time with Haley, during which Tony wasn't even allowed in Haley's bedroom. When Haley was old enough to spend time with other kids, Harold was the one to pick who she had playdates with, and he always remained present to watch over his daughter. Even after Haley grew out of her crib, Harold kept a baby monitor sitting in her room. It was always switched on. Even when Harold wasn't in Haley's room, he was watching. She was observed by him for almost every second of her life. Yvonne and Bob were perceptive enough to find all of that behavior incredibly strange. Harold didn't try to hide the control he had over Haley. Even when talking to his in-laws, he made it very clear that he was the one who made decisions for his daughter. Tony's parents knew without a doubt that their daughter's marriage wasn't a happy one. They knew that this kind of motherhood was not what she wanted, and that she must be suffering terribly from having her relationship with her only child policed and controlled like this. But at the same time, Yvonne and Bob felt helpless. Tony had already been married and divorced once, and since then, her connection with God and her faith had only gotten stronger. They couldn't imagine that Tony would initiate a second divorce, especially when it meant that it could affect her custody of Haley. With Tony under Harold's control, Yvonne and Bob felt like they knew nothing about the daughter they had once been so close to. But they were also starting to feel like they didn't know Harold as well as they'd thought. The facade that he'd put up to the world and the things that he'd bragged about during their phone calls just didn't make sense. He repeatedly boasted about how many staff he hired as a fundraiser and how he netted millions of dollars of income per year. But on the rare occasions when Yvonne managed to talk to Tony alone, Tony revealed that she'd secretly looked at Harold's bank accounts and found that he had much less money than he said he did. In fact, Tony's parents had been the ones to gift her and Harold the money they needed for their new house and car in Colorado. Yvonne desperately tried to communicate with Tony about Harold's controlling personality, his job, and the way he'd isolated her away from her family. But every time Yvonne began that conversation, Tony would quickly shut her down. She said, quote, If you do that, I'll suffer the consequences. She didn't specify what those consequences were, but she didn't need to. 
Harold hated being questioned by anyone, but especially by his wife, who he believed should always be willing to do things the way he wanted. No matter what Tony wanted or needed, she was never able to win a single argument with her husband. Things were done Harold's way or they weren't done at all. Tony's family weren't the only people who noticed how controlling Harold was. Tony's manager, Tammy Abrascado, reported that, quote, Harold was very controlling. Tony was not able to schedule anything outside of her normal schedule without first consulting with Harold. For years, Tony's loved ones were forced to watch as a pattern of control and isolation continued. Yvonne and Bob only had real, honest conversations with their daughter on the rare occasions that they would travel to see her in person and manage to talk to her away from Harold. Sometimes, they felt hopeful for their daughter when it seemed as if Harold's control was lessening and Tony was becoming happier. But those periods of time would end and things always went back to the way they were. After what happened at Harold's cabin in the mountains, Yvonne and Bob lost hope completely. A few years prior, Harold had purchased a mountain cabin near Denver where he liked to go on short vacations with Tony and Haley. On one of those cabin visits, something happened to Tony that resulted in her being hospitalized for several days. Over the phone, Harold brushed the incident off, telling Yvonne that, quote, it was nothing. It was only during Yvonne and Bob's next in-person conversation with their daughter that they found out why she had been in the hospital. It was late at night, Tony said, and Haley was already in bed. Harold had asked her to come outside with him to help clean up. Tony had stood facing away from Harold, looking at the cabin's back porch, when suddenly she was knocked to the ground by a vicious blow to her neck. Immediately, her fingers went numb and pain coursed through her body. Harold called an ambulance, and when the paramedics asked Tony what had happened, she had no idea. One second, she'd been fine, and the next, she'd been crumpled on the ground. During her recovery from her injury, Tony was terrified that she wouldn't regain sensation in her fingers and that her career in medicine would come to an end. Harold had been the one to tell Tony what had actually happened. According to him, a heavy wooden beam had rolled off the porch, hitting her in the neck and fracturing one of her vertebrae. She told her parents that she was lucky it hadn't hit her in the head. She said, quote, If I hadn't bent down after I walked outside, the beam would have killed me. Yvonne looked at Tony in horror, wondering if her daughter could possibly believe that Harold was telling the truth. Yvonne told her daughter flat out, quote, I don't think that was an accident at all. Tony didn't answer, so Yvonne continued speaking, hoping that something she said would hit home. She finally verbalized her suspicions about Harold's income, which she didn't think was from his career at all. In fact, she thought that Harold was still living off his previous wife's life insurance money and lying to everyone about where his wealth was coming from. She didn't think that Harold was really traveling around the country for his job. Maybe he was having an affair. Either way, he wasn't who Tony thought he was. He was dangerous. When Tony remained silent, Yvonne told her, quote, You do with this what you want to, but I would be very careful. I would not go anywhere alone with this man. Tony never acknowledged the conversation, and a few days later, she returned back home. Yvonne and Bob never saw their daughter again. Despite the warning from her own mother to not go anywhere alone with Harold, it wasn't long before Tony would do just that when she went hiking with him in the Rocky Mountain National Park in September of 2012. He would return from the hiking trip, but Tony would not. On the afternoon of Tony's death, Tony's brother Barry received a text from Harold. It read, quote, Barry, urgent. Tony is injured in Estes Park. Fall from rock. Minutes later, a second text came through saying only, quote, She's gone. When Tony's cause of death was revealed to her loved ones, they all had the same thought. Her father Bob didn't hesitate to say that thought out loud. Tony hadn't tripped, stumbled, fallen, or lost her balance. No, Harold had pushed her. This was the version of events that Harold gave to the authorities. He and Tony had decided that they would go on a hike together to celebrate their 12th anniversary. Tony's family knew exactly what that meant. Harold had decided to go on a hike, and Tony, who had a chronic knee injury that made long walks painful for her, had no choice but to go along. Harold told one of his friends that he had gone on more than five different hikes on the week before their anniversary, just so he could pick the perfect trail to walk with Tony. He also said that he'd planned out every minute of the hike. How much he'd planned and what exactly he'd planned would become clear only a few days later. 
For the first two miles, Harold and Tony's hike up Deer Mountain seemed to go well. Then, according to Harold, Tony had begun walking more slowly. Harold hadn't realized that his wife was no longer walking behind him, and when he did, he turned around to find her. It was then that he looked over the edge of a steep cliff and saw Tony lying at the bottom. Without any prompting, Harold's version of events soon shifted. No, Tony hadn't fallen behind him on the hike. In fact, he'd been distracted after receiving a text message and stopped to read it. During the time he was looking at his phone, Tony must have fallen over the side of the cliff, but he hadn't seen what happened. Then, Harold's story changed a third time. He hadn't been looking at his phone at all, he'd actually been posing for a photo that Tony was taking of him. While trying to get a better angle for the photo, Tony had taken a step backwards, causing her to fall off the cliff to her death. Three completely contradicting stories was more than enough for investigators to become suspicious of Harold. Regardless, Harold changed his story a fourth and final time, telling investigators that he'd been distracted by checking Tony's cell phone to see if any calls from her workplace had come through. Out of all of his versions of events, this one was the most easily debunked. Tony's co-workers revealed that her phone had been left at work for several days, and that Harold knew that, because he'd come into their office to pick it up himself. Investigators began to look closely at Harold Henthorne. Born on January 10, 1962, Harold grew up outside of Washington, D.C. His father was a veteran of World War II and the Korean War who worked as a mechanical engineer. Harold endured his father's violent alcoholism until he went away to college. While he was at college, his father died of a heart attack. His mother remarried, but it didn't seem that Harold was as close to his family as Tony was to hers. While looking into Harold's past, one thing in particular stuck out. Tony wasn't the first woman to be married to Harold to die under mysterious circumstances. In May of 1995, his previous wife, Lynn, had died in what the Douglas County Sheriff's Office had considered to be a tragic accident. In early 2013, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department received a letter from the United States Department of the Interior, the department responsible for managing and protecting all of America's national parks, including the Rocky Mountain National Park where Tony Henthorn had recently died. The letter requested that Douglas County law enforcement reopen a case that had concluded almost two decades before. The detective assigned to the case was Dave Weaver, a Vietnam veteran who had spent more than 20 years working on Air Force bases. He'd spent the better part of 10 years investigating gritty sex crimes, approaching even the most disturbing cases with a collected demeanor and analytical mind. On paper, Detective Weaver was now retired. In reality, he was anything but. Detective Weaver's mantra for investigating work was, do it carefully, not quickly. He applied this same approach to the case he was now reopening, the death of Sandra Rochelle, who went by the nickname Lynn. Lynn's death was a case that had passed through the Douglas County Sheriff's Office long before Detective Weaver began working there, and at the time of her death, she'd been married to Harold Henthorne. Lynn's cause of death was massive trauma caused by being crushed underneath her own car, a Jeep Cherokee that she and Harold had bought together. Harold and Lynn had been out on a drive when they'd gotten a flat tire, forcing them to pull over. Lynn had been underneath the car searching for a lug nut that she'd accidentally dropped when the car had somehow fallen on top of her. Harold had been the only witness to Lynn's death. At the time of Lynn's passing, her death wasn't regarded as suspicious. Authorities had accepted that her death was exactly what it seemed to be, a tragic accident. Lynn's family, however, felt differently. They knew that Lynn had suffered from bad arthritis, which meant she wouldn't have tried to crawl underneath a car. According to those who knew her, Lynn had always been cautious, the kind of person who wouldn't risk getting underneath a heavy vehicle. Now, almost two decades later, Detective Weaver sat at his desk with Lynn's file in front of him. The file contains several different transcripts of conversations between Harold and Douglas County law enforcement, where he'd answered questions about what happened to Lynn that day. With all of Harold's statements now in one place, Detective Weaver noticed that things didn't seem to add up. In every conversation, Harold had told police slightly different versions of events. 
They were mostly small differences, and maybe at the time they hadn't seemed suspicious. But to Detective Weaver, the conflicts in Harold's story were glaringly obvious, and even though investigators had noticed some of the inconsistencies, nobody had ever dug any further into the story. At the time Lynn died, the Douglas County Sheriff's Office only had five detectives who had seemed to be woefully unprepared to investigate a case like this. The lead detective on the original case had been a detective for less than half a year, without any formal training, and he'd never once worked as a lead detective on a murder investigation. Until Detective Weaver opened Lynn's case file, nobody who had worked at the case had been qualified or prepared to search for the truth. Detective Weaver started compiling a list of all the contradictions in Harold's stories. Some of the lies seemed completely pointless. Harold had told one officer that he and Lynn had been driving towards the east that day, but in another interview, he said that they were driving west. At one point, he'd insisted that they'd been forced to pull over due to a flat tire, and at another point, he'd said that the tire was only a little deflated. Because of the discrepancies in Harold's story, the timeline leading up to Lynn's death had become fuzzy around the edges. It seemed that Harold said that they had left home to go on their drive at around 1 p.m. Then he said it was actually more like 7 p.m., a six-hour difference that nobody ever questioned. They'd been driving to a local restaurant where they planned to eat dinner. No, they'd actually been on their way home from the restaurant when the accident took place. Detectives had never followed through by calling the restaurant to verify Harold's story, and the coroner hadn't examined Lynn's stomach contents to determine whether or not she had had dinner shortly before her death. Things didn't get any clearer when Detective Weaver read through the statements about the incident. The file stated that a helpful group of Good Samaritans had jacked up the car and tried to save Lynn from underneath, but it also said that Harold had been the one to try to save her life. The one thing that both stories had in common was that Lynn had been underneath the Jeep Cherokee, which was held up by two different jacks when the vehicle had somehow fallen on top of her and crushed her to death. After that, Harold's account of events diverged again. Unfortunately, the Jeep had fallen off the jacks after Harold jostled the car by putting the flat tire in the back. No wait, the spare tire had fallen out and jolted the car, causing it to fall on Lynn. After only a few days of investigation, the Douglas County Coroner declared that Lynn's death had been nothing more than a tragic accident. From the very beginning, Harold had never been viewed as a suspect in Lynn's death, despite his inconsistent stories. Despite one of Lynn's co-workers telling police that she believed Lynn's death was suspicious, and despite the discovery that Harold had a criminal record for shoplifting underwear. In the eyes of authorities, he had always been seen as a victim, and just like that, the case was closed. With that conclusion, the jeep that had crushed his wife to death was returned to Harold, and all of the physical evidence was destroyed. Well, almost all of it. Detective Weaver did find one piece of evidence that had been recorded at the scene, the description of a partial footprint on the jeep's wheel well, above the tire that Lynn had allegedly been replacing at the time of her death. The footprint, like the rest of the circumstances surrounding Lynn's death, had only been briefly looked into. Investigators had taken pictures of the print, and they'd also taken pictures of the tread of the shoes Harold had been wearing the day Lynn died. But incredibly, despite collecting these two pieces of evidence, nobody had ever thought to see if Harold's shoes matched the print found in the Jeep's wheel well. Detective Weaver knew that he couldn't convict Harold based on a partial shoe print, but the placement of the print, if it did match Harold's shoe, provided a different version of events, one that made much more sense than the wild variety of stories Harold had provided to authorities. Detective Weaver believed that Harold had left the shoe print when he deliberately kicked the car off the jacks, causing it to fall and crush Lynn to death, and the possible motive was right there in the case file. Harold had received a huge life insurance payout after Lynn's death and lied to authorities about how much it was worth. An innocent man, Detective Weaver believed, would have no reason to lie. Harold had told Douglas County detectives that his wife's life insurance would give him a payout of $300,000, an incredibly large sum of money given that Lynn was employed as a social worker and only earned $14,000 a year. The detectives did something that should never, ever be done while talking to a suspect. They just believed him, and recorded the $300,000 figure as fact. 
If they'd looked into it at all, they would have discovered that Harold had explicitly lied to them. In fact, Lynn's life insurance policy was listed at 600000 double what he had told them. And just before Lynn's accident, Harold had changed her life insurance policy himself. The change he made meant that if Lynn died in an accident, the payment he received would be doubled. Taking Harold at face value about Lynn's life insurance wasn't the only major fumble that the detectives working the case had made. Detective Weaver found a list of contact details for several witnesses who had information about Lynn's death, but nobody had ever contacted them. A note had been added to the file from somebody who had called the Douglas County Sheriff's Office the day after Lynn died, asking them, quote, Did you arrest the husband yet? The name of that caller was Patricia Montoya. Detective Weaver called Patricia Montoya himself. He introduced himself as a detective from Douglas County and asked her, quote, do you have any idea why I'm calling? Two decades had passed since Patricia had made that call about Lynn's death, but her answer was immediate. She replied, quote, That woman on the mountain. She told Detective Weaver that the accident and the way Harold had behaved after it remained, quote, the creepiest thing she'd ever seen. Over the phone, Detective Weaver listened to what Patricia had witnessed that day. She'd spent the day fishing with her family, and they'd been driving home together when they saw a man waving them down from the side of the road. They pulled over to help him. It was Harold Henthorne, minutes after the car had crushed Lynn. From the beginning, the way Harold behaved was extremely alarming to Patricia and the rest of her family. Even though Harold had been the one to flag her car down and ask for help, he was furious with them when they helped to lift up the car and pull Lynn's body out. They didn't know if she was unconscious or dead, but the group decided to perform CPR anyway. Harold let them make that decision for him, and he didn't offer to perform CPR on his own wife. Patricia suggested that Harold take off his coat to keep Lynn warm because the night was freezing cold, and she was only dressed in a t-shirt. Harold refused. He was freezing, his wife was dying, or possibly already dead, and Harold refused to take off his coat. Patricia couldn't believe his behavior. She took off her own jacket to keep Lynn warm, and left it wrapped around her body when emergency responders arrived to take over. The reason Patricia had called the Douglas County Sheriff's Office the following day had partially been to ask if she could have her jacket back, and partially to find out what had happened to Lynn. When she was informed that Lynn had passed away, she responded with the question that had been recorded in Lynn's case file. Did you arrest the husband yet? Despite being a witness that night, the one-sentence quote was the only record of Patricia Montoya in the case file. It was only by luck that Detective Weaver had found it and thought to follow through by calling her. He then moved on to all of the other witnesses. The next woman he spoke to, a fire department volunteer named Rebecca Roberts, told him a remarkably similar story. She'd been one of the first responders who had arrived at the scene of the accident, and in the years since then, she'd become the West Douglas County Fire Department's chief. In her job, she'd seen no shortage of tragic accidents and horrible deaths, but what she saw on the night Lynn had died stuck with her. Rebecca was used to attending accidents where she saw friends and family members panicking and crying out of fear and sadness for their injured or deceased loved ones. It wasn't unusual for spouses to fly into such a state of panic that they physically assaulted first responders. This, however, hadn't been the case with Harold Henthorne. When Rebecca arrived at the scene, she'd found Harold to be so eerily calm that she'd never forgotten that particular accident. Despite a career spanning multiple decades, she insisted that the circumstances surrounding Lynn's death, especially how Harold had behaved shortly afterwards, were the most unusual she'd ever seen. Detective Weaver continued to follow his mantra of, do it carefully, not quickly. The circumstances of Lynn's death were still eating at him, and he decided to answer the question the old-fashioned way. Test it himself. He sourced a similar model of Jeep Cherokee to the one that Lynn and Harold had been driving that night, as well as the same make of car jacks that Harold had supposedly used to lift the car. He drove the Jeep, retracing Lynn's final minutes and pulling it off the road at the same place her life had ended. He used the jacks to lift the car, doing everything exactly the way Harold had said. Then he set about testing all of Harold's stories, one by one. Harold had said that the Jeep had fallen after he threw the flat tire in the back. Detective Weaver tried it. The car didn't move. He threw it with more and more force until the car was shuddering, but it didn't fall. 
He tried a different angle. Harold said that there were two jacks, but maybe he'd only used one. Detective Weaver removed the second jack and threw the spare tire into the back of the Jeep as hard as he could. Again, nothing. One by one, he ran through every scenario, but nothing caused the car to fall. Finally, he was left with only one thing left to test. The reason that he believed had caused a men's shoe print to be found above the missing tire. He placed his foot in the exact location that the print had been found and kicked hard, and the jeep fell from the jacks. If anyone had been underneath the car, they would have been crushed, just like Lynn was. In Detective Weaver's mind, that discovery cemented the conclusion he reached from the muddled testimonies from Harold and the reports of his strange behavior. I know he killed her, he said to himself, but there was no way to prove it. While Detective Weaver had been investigating Lynn's death, a team of other detectives were looking into Tony's. Only a handful of days after Tony had passed away, investigators searched Harold's car and discovered a map of the area where Tony had fallen to her death. At first glance, it wasn't unusual. Either Harold or Tony had used a pink pen to highlight the trail that they were planning on walking that day. But something else had been added to the map, before either of them set foot on the trail. A small X had been marked directly over the cliff that Tony had fallen from. Before the hike even began, Harold had already known that Tony wouldn't be hiking back with him. He'd known because he'd planned exactly where he was going to push her to her death. During the investigation, Harold's cell records showed that he had visited the exact same trail where Tony had died nine times before that final fatal trip. In the time before Harold was arrested, he confessed to Tony's family that he hadn't had a job the entire time he was married to her. He told them that Tony hated living in Mississippi, hated her job, and she wanted to move to Colorado. He explained that she knew her parents wouldn't approve of the move if they knew neither of them had a job lined up there, so he lied about his job. The Bartolais knew that nothing that came out of Harold's mouth was true, but they didn't challenge his story. They just made note of everything he had told them so they could relay it to authorities, hoping it would help the investigation. Harold was arrested for the murder of Tony on November 6, 2014. At his trial, Harold Henthorne maintained his innocence, claiming that Tony's death was merely an accident. The defense argued to exclude the details of Lynn's death as well as the details about the accident that sent Tony to the hospital not long before her death. He said that those details would make his client look guilty. Yeah, they absolutely did, and it was because he was. Fortunately, the judge sided with the prosecution and those details were allowed to be introduced at trial because they showed a clear pattern of behavior. Another detail that the jury learned was that Harold was due to receive a potential $4.5 million insurance payout from three different policies taken out by Harold not long before Tony's death. The defense didn't call a single witness, and despite his attempt to raise reasonable doubt, the jury found Harold Henthorne guilty of the first-degree murder of Tony Henthorne. He was given a life sentence. Harold appealed his conviction and lost in 2015. There's been talk of trying Harold for the murder of Lynn, but as of now, no steps have been taken to make that happen. Shortly before he was handed his life sentence, Harold told the court, quote, Tony was a remarkable woman. I loved her with all my heart. I did not kill Tony or anyone else. Making Harold Henthorne not only a monster who murdered two women for money, but a flat-out liar. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org.
Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.